Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Now, live and direct from the press box at Old Comiskey Park, it's time for When Football Was Football. Let's join your host, Joe Ziemba, with another forgotten tale from Chicago's pro football history. Let's go! Thank you for that warm introduction, and welcome to When Football Was Football, here on the Sports History Network. I'm your host, Joe Ziemba. In this episode, we're going to go back to the very beginnings of the National Football League and interview Joseph T. Sterneman. And you may ask, who is Joseph T. Sterneman? Well, Sterneman was more commonly known as Joey Sterneman during his professional football playing career from 1922 to 1930. As such, Joey was actually the very first quarterback of the Chicago Bears when the team incorporated in Chicago in 1922. He was also the head coach of the Duluth Kellys in 1923, as well as the player-slash-owner-slash-coach of the short-lived Chicago Bulls in 1926, when that team was a member of the original American Football League with Red Grange. And for a short time, he was also a part-time owner, or a part-owner, I should say, of the Chicago Bears. More importantly, Sturman was a trailblazer during the early years of the NFL, wreaking havoc on opposition defenses with his running, passing, and kicking skills. He was named to all pro teams after four different seasons and is included in the honored list of the 100 greatest bears of all time as compiled by the Chicago Tribune. And all of this was accomplished by a player who stood just five foot six and weighed in at around 135 pounds for most of his career. His inspirational performances and Sterneman's fearless attitude on the field prompted legendary writer Grantland Rice to state, 139-pound Joe Sterneman could wreck any two or 250-pound man he ever saw in the rough and tumble. While we have covered Joey Sternman before on When Football Was Football, a document shared recently by Sternman's daughter Joyce has provided us with the opportunity to interview Sternman with responses in his own words from over 40 years ago. The Sternman family provides us with a direct link from the very beginning of the NFL to the present day. So the basis for this podcast on the Sports History Network was a speech delivered by Joseph T. Sterneman before the Kiwanis Club of Elgin, Illinois on April 8, 1980. And we thank Joyce for her assistance in keeping the history of pro football alive and well. So sit back and enjoy this journey into football's enjoyable past for one who was there. Before we begin, we asked Joey for any initial thoughts regarding his career, and I'm going to ask the questions as well as answer them, but using the words of Joey Sterneman. So, his initial thoughts regarding his career? Well, thank you. And as you may know, I was the Chicago Bears' first quarterback. I hope my first-hand memories of the early days will be of interest to you. When did your career begin with the Chicago Bears? Well, my start with the Bears began on May 2nd, 1922, when my brother Ed Sterneman, also called Dutch, and George Hallis signed the incorporation papers for the Chicago Bears. Prior to that time, they were the managers of the Staley's, which began in Decatur, Illinois. I never played with the Staley's, but was quarterback for the Bears right from the beginning and played until 1930. 
What was the attitude of fans, college coaches, and others regarding professional football in the 1920s? Well, you may not remember that when professional football started, it wasn't looked on with favor by many people. For instance, the great coach at Chicago University, Alonzo Stagg, was vehemently opposed to it. He believed it should be reserved for schools and colleges. The very idea of having professional teams was not to be tolerated. And I guess Bob Zupke, the coach at Illinois, felt much the same way because when Red Grange decided to join the Chicago Bears in 1925, Zupke did everything he could to talk Red out of it. Lots of people then seemed to think it was okay for baseball players to be professional, but not football players. When did you begin playing sports, specifically football, and was your older brother Dutch an influence? Yeah, ever since I can remember, I was involved in athletics, one kind or another, in my hometown of Springfield, Illinois. I got interested in bicycle racing, tennis, and wrestling, but eventually I concentrated on football. My brother, who was five years older than I, was captain of the Springfield High School football team, and he used to tell me things he learned from the coach while I was still in grammar school. You became an excellent kicker at Springfield High School. How did you perfect that particular skill? Well, I used to practice drop kicking in our backyard until I really had it down pat. I remember how my drop kicking came in handy even when I was a freshman in high school in the game against Carlinville in particular. As a freshman, you were not eligible to be on the first team, so I was on the second team. In that game, we made yardage against them but were stopped short of making a touchdown, so I would drop kick. I made three successful drop kicks that day, and that was the only score in the game. My practicing had paid off. When you look back at your career, what are some of the biggest changes that you have witnessed in the game of football itself? It's interesting to look back and note that the changes that have taken place in football since I was a kid. One of the differences in football at that time was that we had three downs to make 10 yards, not four as it is today. Another difference is that there was no passing. It was a running game. When passing started, you had to be five yards behind the line of scrimmage before you were permitted to make a pass. And as you know, today passing is the name of the game, so to speak. And then you were off to the University of Illinois. Was your lack of size an issue for you at the collegiate level? Well, I only weighed 135 pounds when I played at the University of Illinois, so I learned a few tricks to compensate for the differences in my size compared to some of the other fellows. When playing safety on defense, for instance, I would stand sideways, and as I caught the ball, I'd take a step sideways, then turn completely around before starting to run. I'd roll off the shoulder of the tackler most of the time and keep on running. This twirling kept me from getting hurt. During your career at Illinois, can you recall any major changes in the game that took place during that time? Uh, one thing that an old-timer would not recognize is the huddle. I was a quarterback at Illinois when we played the University of Chicago in 1921. Our coach, Bob Zupke again, introduced the huddle in that game. He made football history in many ways, but it seemed odd that nobody ever thought of the huddle before Zupke. After he used it, it was taken up all over the country. By having a huddle, any player in the team could make suggestions regarding any weaknesses of the defense. In those days, you could not send in plays with a substitute. And what else has changed about football since your career began? Well, a few more differences that I noticed through the years are that they didn't used to have official signals. No little red flags. Spectators could hardly tell what was going on. There was no nice electric scoreboard to give details, tell what quarter it was, or whether there was a penalty and how much time was left to play. Also, before 1919, players didn't wear numbers on their backs. Going back even farther, few headgears were used. There were no tees to hold the ball. And as a kicker, I made mounds out of mud for kicking off. Remember, there was no TV and certainly no instant replays. If I remember correctly, even though you were the quarterback for the Bears, you still played both ways during the game without a substitute. How did that work? 
One of the most striking changes, in my opinion, has been the way football now resembles a chess game with coaches directing the play. It used to be that there were no coaching from the sidelines. The quarterback was the general. He had full charge about how the game was played. It used to be a team of 11 players, with the quarterback running the game and a few substitutions. Today, as you know, substitutes are sent in to make one play. We play the whole game, defense and offense. When the Bears started, we couldn't afford to hire a bunch of guys to sit on the bench, and I never enjoyed sitting on the bench anyhow. Those of us who played every minute of the game were nicknamed 60 Minute Men. Golly, I could go in the game on my Sunday clothes if all I had to do was kick for the point after touchdown nowadays. One of the most important things that occurred during your career was the arrival of Red Grange in 1925 and the ensuing two tours that the Bears scheduled to both showcase Grange as well as raise some funds for the franchise. What was that first Red Grange tour like? Well, for the first tour through the Midwest and the East, we played eight games in 11 days right after Red Grange joined us in 1925. I've often talked about this because no football team has ever attempted anything like it before or since either. We played in Cubs Park against the Cardinals on Thanksgiving Day of 1925, which was a Thursday. Then we played in St. Louis on Saturday, New York on Sunday, where 73,000 fans crowded into the polo grounds, which only seated 65,000. There was standing room only. On the following Tuesday, we played in Washington, D.C., then Wednesday in Boston, and Thursday in Pittsburgh. We finished with a Saturday game in Detroit, and finally on Sunday, back home in Cubs Park for the eighth game in 11 days. I played 60 minutes of every one of those games except the one in Pittsburgh. I'll tell you, it was no picnic, you may be sure. So how did the second tour differ from the initial tour? After resting our battered and bruised bodies for a week or so, we took off on another tour beginning in January of 1926. This one was more leisurely and luxurious than the first tour, not such an ordeal. We had our own Pullman car and personal porter. Our first game was in Memphis. From there we went to Jacksonville, Florida, then Tampa. A week later we played in Miami. The following Sunday we played in New Orleans and took it in in the sights all along the way. Our next game was on a Sunday in Los Angeles where about 85,000 people attended. The following day we, we played in uh, San Diego. A week later we played in San Francisco. The next week we played in Portland and the following week in Seattle. The last game was on February 1st, 1926. Yeah, the tour was enjoyable. We had time for sightseeing and William Wrigley had a big estate on Catalina Island and as the Bears played in Wrigley Field in Chicago, we were honored guests at his mansion on Catalina Island. Did you enjoy any other specific experiences during the tour? Yeah, indeed, I was treated to an airplane ride over Portland, Oregon in an open cockpit plane and sitting on a parachute. The pilot was Lieutenant Oakley Kelly, the first man to fly across the U.S. from dawn to dusk. So as you can see, this was a long time ago when flying across the country was a big deal. We also met some of the most famous movie stars of that era, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, Harold Lloyd, and many others. Altogether, it was a great experience. One final question, Mr. Sternman. During the 1920s, your brother Dutch Sternman and George Hallis were co-owners of the Chicago Bears. How did they decide who would eventually buy the other one out? In those dark days of the Depression, 1930 and 31, professional football was having financial difficulties along with everyone else. Ed and George decided to toss a coin to see who would buy the other out. Believe it or not, my brother won the toss, so George had to buy him out. And just think, if Dutch had only lost, he would have been Papa Bear. With things so tough then, it wasn't easy for George Hallis to scrape up the necessary cash. But he managed to do so, and the rest is history. And thank you for joining us for this episode of When Football Was Football on the Sports History Network. It was enjoyable talking with the legendary Joey Sternman. And once again, our gratitude is extended to his daughter, Joyce, 
for sharing this unique piece of pro football history. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Do you wish you knew more about the 100 seasons of the NFL? You're in luck because you found the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. From the founding of the league in an auto showroom, all the way to what it is today, America's favorite sport and a behemoth of an industry. My name is Ernie Chapman. Football is my passion, and I want you to come along with me each week to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board, my DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. (laughs) How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.